James Chan, it's great to have you here, a principal with Newtene Labs. He and Joy Ito, who many of you know, are really extraordinary minds thinking about what's happening in the world in the sense of innovation overall, and have been backing startups literally all over the globe, which is almost unprecedented in the way it. There are obvious reasons why so many of us watch and are impressed by Asia, and I'm wondering what lessons you've seen from your perch there and how you're thinking about startup ecosystems that might be relevant to MENA. So, um, very happy to be here. It's my first trip to Jordan and first trip to this region since the past five, six years. Uh, last trip was in Dubai. That didn't count. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was interesting that Chris asked me this question last evening. We talked about it. And uh, I, I went back to the Singapore. I'm based in Singapore. And uh, even though the fund invests in the U.S., U.K., Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, and I've been watching the scene in the Asia-Pacific region uh, grow since '06. And it was a desert. It wasn't even an oasis in the past, right, uh, back there. But really, the, the recent uh, shift in you know, platforms, uh, making it easy for distribution, payments, even if I'm not uh, having a payment processing service in Singapore, I could easily sign up for something in Delaware and just get started accepting payments from a US currency account, right, merchant account. So it's gotten so much easier for people to get started. Uh, in, you know, our fund is only 5 million, right? But we were able to fund 24 companies with the 5 million, right? And uh, it's still, we still have money left. And, and uh, you know, we also have an unfair advantage in the sense that the Singapore government gave us a very interesting funding leverage where every dollar I, we invest in to companies there, uh, the government will co-invest $5.67 into uh, the, the, the companies there. So we've been able to really stretch the dollar even on the venture capital side of it, uh, which was not possible before, right? Not to mention the entrepreneurs themselves who were able to just sit down there, build something very quickly, right? Uh, Henry, who gave a talk earlier, was just telling, telling me how he quickly put a flashlight app together, right? Uh, when, when, when his cousin was just talking about it, he just did it, right? So things like that make it really possible for regions that would never dream of having some sort of action away from the valley. Right. You're starting to see that happen uh, in a big way. In, Asia, in Southeast Asia, right, uh, I, I go around the region, you particularly notice this in Singapore, Manila, Jakarta, uh, part, a little bit in Kuala Lumpur, because think people there tend to be more dispersed. But, but you see that Vietnam, you, know, you see that happening, and I'm very, very psyched up about what's there to come from MENA and also from that region. Yeah. So, I mean, as an investor who is so global and all, Obviously, one has to be sensitive of thinking about region and the distinctions about region. But do you, in fact, think a lot about region? Or do you think about just the entrepreneur and the opportunity? Yeah. And, and how do you think about, now this is your first trip to Jordan, so, how are you thinking about coming here? So, so this ties in a little bit to my own theory of where the world is heading towards. Uh, you know, we're, we're moving towards cities as the future, where I mean, more than half the world's population in cities. Uh, I gave a talk previously about you know, that. And, uh, you know, because of that, you, you can see the world, the markets. I see the markets in two segments. Right? One segment is the city demographics, where you have high mobile penetration, high broadband penetration, generally higher per capita GDP, and uh, then the emerging market uh, you know, regions where they live in the dollar economy, where you know, in Indonesia, people buy, buy shampoo in dollar sachets. They don't, they don't spend beyond what they earn every day. Right? And, and so, but yet they're willing to spend a dollar out of the five dollars they earn a day on SIM cards. And, and that's interesting. So you've got two distinct markets that I see, uh, that I view the world from. Uh, and, and as we move forward, you'll see that a lot more. Uh, there might be some in-betweens, but then uh, they tend to, in my opinion, from the money and opportunity perspective, converge in these two baskets. What's intrigued you most in coming to MENA so far? Say that again? What has intrigued you most coming to MENA so far with your VC hat on? Intrigued you? you mean in, in Interested you? Uh, you mean in the trends or just coming here? Your impressions? Oh, you mean this region, right? Uh, you know, when I when I look at the region, I mean, I'm very new to Mina. Uh, so when I look at a new region, I always go from understanding society and how that's happening, how different activities happen. Uh, you know, like earlier, I saw a tweet on somebody saying, I mean. Uh, uh, these, the, there's a presentation all about 76% uh, of the e-commerce in the uh, Middle East is males. But in reality, it's, it, I, I bet most of the w ladies are the ones asking their husbands to buy it for them or something. Or like, use my credit card, right? Uh, figure it out. So that kind of subtlety you don't get by just looking at it from afar. You have to come in here and really understand how things are happening here. 
So that's interesting. And understanding how much a fresh graduate makes, what disposable income levels are like, uh, what, their, what, what typical pastimes are, things like that help me understand the market a lot better and what sort of opportunities uh, exist. Ellie Habib, Ellie Habib needs no introduction, I think, to this audience overall. On the boards of Whoop Run, Moby Nets, the IG runs a barrage uh, out of Lebanon overall with an enormous career uh, with Nokia. Amazing insights from here, from around the world, from Silicon Valley. What are you, what are you seeing now in, in terms of opportunity and hopes in uh, MENA as a in the early stage? Yeah. Uh, uh, so I'm part of uh, Oreos Capital, and I'm, uh, I'm based in Lebanon. I spent uh, long decades in, uh, in the Silicon Valley, and I've seen uh, a lot of uh, paradigm shifts, and of course, I witnessed the e-commerce paradigm shift years ago, and uh, it's interesting to watch it from this, uh, this point of view as, as an investor. Uh, clearly, you could tell that uh, e-commerce is shifting to, to e-commerce in this area, uh, just like uh, any other uh, 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 sector, any, any, any other industry. Um, there are clearly a lot of uh, benefits and uh, attractive areas to, to look for, uh, from an investment point of view, but we still see a lot of obstacles. Um, we, we had the panel that we saw this morning uh, uh, highlighted some of it. One of, one of them is the fact that, and for example, in the U.S., in Europe, and so on, a lot of the e-commerce investment happened at a country level. Okay? For startups, uh, country level uh, investment is very important as it gives you the, the momentum, allows you to... Uh, uh, to, to sharpen your, uh, your model and, and your uh, service and products. The, uh, the challenge we have in the MENA region is that it's a region. It's made up of a lot of countries that actually have uh, really very little, besides some of the GCC countries, very little uh, uh, alignment between them, be it legal, be it uh, custom, be it uh, transportation, be it cost, be it banking system, and be it operators, and so on and so forth. So that provides a big challenge for the startups and the small businesses or the small entrepreneurs that are trying to create scale in terms of e-commerce. And as a result, you start looking at, so which one will provide a better investment, assuming all these obstacles? So there are virtual goods, like, of course, music. That's, that's easy. But then you start looking at the non-virtual goods. And, for example, with Souk.com, you start talking about the, the, the delivery, the return, the customer service, the transportation, the customs. Now, these are all issues that will need government participation, will require policy, will require economic alignment between the various countries in order to facilitate the flow of, of goods and uh, uh, services between the countries. And, and, and we're, we're pretty sure that is going to happen. It's going to happen over time. It's going to happen because you know, these are uh, uh, traditional ways how markets move. You have, you have a innovation that is taking place, and then you have governments that follow that will allow these innovations to influence the way things are implemented. And we're starting to see that. Um, however, one, one important aspect of, of these obstacles is the impact on the financial model. Clearly, a lot of the startups want to grow and scale uh, and and the, uh, the first uh, point that we look at is, so how big is this market? Okay, so somebody is, is doing sports good. They want to sell sports good in the MENA region. The first question I'll ask is, how big is this market? Where is this market? Who are the buyers? How much are they going to spend online? And at the end of the day, what is the profit? Is this a business that will allow you to build a sustainable, profitable business long term. This is a fundamental point because as investors, we just don't enter the market. We also would like to exit the market. We'd like to make profit. And to make profit, we make profit in the long term on the value created by this business financially, by the value created on this business at the level of consumers, at the level of markets, at the level of, of uh, uh, job created. So there is not only one dimension, but the financial dimension is very important. I invite all the entrepreneurs, as you are looking at, I have this fantastic idea for the MENA region, to think about it, how important is the market of, of this and how valuable it is in terms of 
creating sustainable long-term business. The second thing is what we notice is we always talk about e-commerce and internet business in the MENA region as it relates to UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. And because of Egypt's having problem, we say, okay, Saudi Arabia. By default, Saudi Arabia. And UAE is almost like a testing ground for Saudi Arabia or as a marketing ground or as a business ground. And for many of the Jordanian companies here, just like Lebanese companies, it's almost there are two camps. There are the camps where you have entrepreneurs creating businesses, and then you have the consumer markets that are Saudi Arabia. There's almost like a divide. What we would like to see and what's, what's really important to project in the future and, and will happen is there is no geographical business divide. There are no consumer markets and there are no producer markets because it is very important at, at this level so that e-commerce is, is the, the, the participation from consumers in e-commerce is pan-Arab, right? If I'm sitting in Lebanon, I want to participate in that e-commerce. If I'm sitting in Jordan, I want to participate in e-commerce, okay? So we have to look at it from not only the scale at, at the Saudi Arabia level, but we have to look at it at scale at region and how are we allowing that digital geo divide not to take place. Um, the third aspect is what, what technology allows you to do is to innovate and be completely crazy in your innovation to engage the user, to maximize the user visit to your site and to basically take your uh, product and services in a, in a differentiated way where nobody else actually is, 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 is selling. So look at, look at it not only in terms of providing a digital service to a service that exists in a brick and mortar way, but look at it from innovation point of view. How can you innovate now, tomorrow, and the day after in terms of differentiation, in terms of user engagement, in terms of user experience, in terms of the average selling price, and in terms of profitability. You have at your, at your disposal a lot of tools, a lot of platforms, so leverage that, innovate, innovate, even in an e-commerce point of view, because that is what's gonna make the difference in the long term. Um, and then a final point, in e-commerce, what we've seen in the US a long time ago, is there are the pure play e-commerce investments and startups, pure play like Amazon, like eBay, and there are, what, what happened afterwards, there were some consolidation where the brick and mortar businesses, like the actual brands, like the actual shopping centers, the, 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 the big, like Costco, if, if somebody knows Costco, they went online. And they provided a lot of the e-commerce online that supports their brick and mortar. So it became more of a strategic expansion of their business model versus a pure play. And that after a while, the market balanced off and leveled off between pure play and brick and mortar. So I suspect that we're going to see some the same thing he, uh, happening here. For example, when I look at this audience right now, I see nothing but pure play startups in e-commerce. I don't see traditional uh, players in the market that are actually talking about their digital strategy and the expansion of their business model into the digital strategy. That's a very important aspect. And I think at one point it's going to happen. And when it happens, the market will consolidate, the market will shift, and we'll see suddenly a, an explosion of e-commerce. And I believe that we are at the, at, the, at the early stage. We haven't hit inflection point. We haven't hit really the, the hyper growth that we expect to see from the e-commerce uh, in the MENA region.